Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon and welcome to The Post 7, Gaslighting in the Workplace. I've received more requests for this vlog than any other topic while we were recording the COVID quartet endlessly these requests for this topic emerged in my inbox. The first request came from the legendary Thomas. Thomas actually remembered, and you might remember too, the vlog that I did in the previous series on gaslighting for PhD students. He had suffered that greatly, but he said to me, even now he's a postdoc, he is still suffering the consequences of it and asked if I would go there again. Thomas, my pleasure to do so. And then, of course, we have the truly remarkable Gail. Gail's a friend of mine, remarkable researcher, incredible teacher, inspirational leader. And Gail wanted me to think about why gaslighting is increasing in the contemporary university. Gail and Thomas, it's my absolute pleasure and has been my absolute pleasure to look at the really new, the really recent research and see what we can do about it. But I also need to log the 28 other people that requested this vlog who I'm going to make sure they remain anonymous because they're in the middle of this situation right now. So I've read widely on the literature, particularly with regard to organisational culture. And I also wanted to acknowledge the commentary from a wonderful, I've got a stray here, there we go. Uh, acknowledge the commentary from a wonderful friend and colleague of mine, the legendary Adrian Martin. I've known Adrian, Adrian how long? 25 years, 28 years. And Adrian, as always, offered a very strong critique of what I was reading at the time. Adrian argued that the literature that I was investigating for this particular video, this particular vlog, was too focused on narcissists. And he argued that we need to be thinking about gaslighting in a different way beyond this sort of pretty poor pathology of narcissism. And Adrian, you are absolutely right and you remain absolutely brilliant. So in response to these remarkable requests and Adrian's critique, I'm gonna offer two vlogs, two on gaslighting. I'm gonna be investigating gaslighting and how it is used as a managerial technique. So I'm gonna do all the work today to show how and why gaslighting exists in organizational culture, particularly in the contemporary university, but also in schools and wider workplaces. And I will not default to narcissists use gaslighting. Instead, instead, I'm going to look at gaslighting as a managerial technique in the contemporary workplace. And I'm gonna look at how and why it is normalized and naturalized in our daily working lives. Now you're gonna see resonance to all sorts of workplaces, all sorts of public and private organizations today. And then the second post that I'm going to explore next week on gaslighting will focus completely on the remarkable requests I received. The people in the middle of this situation right now, hello, we are with you. And so what I've done is used all the research I've found to gather up for next week a series of strategies when you are in the middle of it, how to manage it and how to handle it. So let's start with gaslighting and its definitions. So gaslighting is a term that has cultural origins. I know it's used in business studies, I know it's used in psychology, but it has a cultural origin. It comes from a play written by Patrick Hamilton in 1938, and the play was titled Gas Light two separate words and then it became a famous film there was a film made in the united kingdom and released in 1940 but then the famous george q core film was released in 1944 and this film featured ingrid bergman and charles boyer his character gregory met the beautiful opera singer paula and they have a whirlwind romance and they marry then Gregory uses every opportunity to create profound vulnerability and confusion in Paula so that she questions her own sanity, her own rendering of reality. With Paula in this weakened state, 
Gregory's rather violent past and present can be hidden. Okay, so from this film, we have a technique, we have a strategy that's called gaslighting. Now, I'm going to talk about the most common techniques that we see in gaslighting. Now, you're going to see that these, what I'm really calling managerial techniques now, are not limited to the tool bag of narcissists at all. They have been generalized through neoliberal organizational culture. And I'll talk about why this is happening shortly. So let's just list the gaslighting techniques, okay? And yes, most of us who have lived in the world <laughs> have seen these through our lives. So gaslighters use our own words against us. Private information is twisted and warped and then released for public commentary and discussion against us. These people plot against you overtly they lie and isolate you from your family and your friends they deny your requirements they deny your needs to make sure that the focus remains exclusively on themselves the optics are always on them so they rely on excessive displays of power and they construct alternative facts in other words, lies, and then try and convince people to subscribe to their alternative facts, or indeed, lies. So what gaslighting does, its point, is to disorient a person, to place doubt in a person's mind, often using the most trivial of incidents. So for workers in the contemporary workplace, this is a toxic an incredibly frightening combination. Through these techniques, through these tactics, human beings are delegitimized. Human beings are shamed. So the goal of gaslighting as a managerial technique is to make us suffer, to consolidate and increase the power of the powerful and increase your dependence on them. So while the visual representation of gaslighters is on men, that's absolutely not the case. Men and women use gaslighting and it's not a gendered formation. Having said that, I've also tried to find the research on trans and non-binary identifying workers and managers. That research in gaslighting is not really present, but I have a Google Scholar alert up. So the moment that research appears, we'll revisit this issue. So. We have a pretty strong understanding now of gaslighting as a series of techniques, what it is and how it is actioned. And I'm sure every single one of you have seen different techniques like that used in your life. So these techniques are used to reinforce power when power is threatened. So I want to talk about why they're particularly being used now. But before I do, I did want to tell a personal story. I wanted to explain what gaslighting actually looks like in a workplace and particularly in a university. Now, obviously, a lot of you sent some unbelievably horrifying stories to me. I was in tears a lot when I was reading the emails. They are your private stories. I respect that. As you know, I replied to you and said they are your private stories. And I thank you for sharing them with me. But I thought, well, what does this actually look like for people? Let's take this for a walk. And so I'm going to share a story from me. It's my story. It's my story to share. And I'm going to share it. Now, as you know, <laughs> I've worked in some truly dreadful universities. And I've worked for some truly dreadful managers. Some truly dreadful leaders. I'm really uncomfortable using the word leader. You'll hear me move between the categories. They're very different things. But I've worked for some truly dreadful leaders. Heavy inverted commas there. But the worst person I ever worked for used all these techniques that I'm talking about today, not only against me, but about against all the high performing professors in her faculty. So in a sixth, six month period under this particular dean, eight full professors resigned and went on to other jobs. One professor retired and another colleague killed himself. And importantly, her line managers 
let her do this. But in the end, their lack of action impacted on them because the provost was magically disappeared overnight. One morning he was in his office, the next morning he was gone and no one ever heard of him again. And the president and vice-chancellor was a one-term president and vice-chancellor and has now been erased from the history of the organisation. So this gaslighting dean did a huge amount of damage. So let me just tell you one incident from this woman that occurred in a 30 minute meeting, 30 minutes in the history of international higher education. So she called this 30 minute meeting with me and my late husband, Professor Steve Redhead. I was a professor in communication. Steve was a professor in law and the HR representative for the faculty was also present. So the Dean sat at the table with the HR representative. So they were sitting down as we walked in and Steve and I were instructed to stand. Okay, so she said she had two matters to address, one to me and one to Steve. Now you notice we were married, but if there are matters to explore and discuss, surely professionalism would require that separate meetings are held. But of course, this meeting was antithetical to any understanding of professionalism. It was about gaslighting. So the first matter she wished to discuss was my teaching review from the first semester at the university because the results had been released the previous week. Now, I not only had received the best teaching review in the history of this particular faculty, I received the best teaching review in the history of the institution. Now, nobody was more surprised than me. It was a large first year course. It was my first teaching in a, in a new country. And there were a huge, huge number of students that took it as an elective. So everything was wrong for me to be able to get this high score. And of course, teaching evaluations in this university were benchmarked with all the standard deviations and so forth. And the scale of the result surprised me. I was pleased because I worked hard and I wanted to care for these new students in this new university because I thought we'd be there until the end of our careers. But I didn't talk about the review at all. I hadn't shared it with anyone. You know, teaching reviews, they're complicated, a lot of controversy around them. They're a private matter and you can review them and think about them in terms of your own life. But what actually happened was the previous week, a teaching and learning person from their teaching and learning centre had come to a faculty meeting and mentioned the result. And of course, colleagues thought that was great and that's lovely and so forth. But what happened was that meeting ended, the faculty meeting ended, and the dean must have walked straight back to her office and immediately called this 8am meeting with Steve and I. So she started this meeting with the following phrases. Quote, you're not as good as you think you are. We've all received teaching evaluations like this. This result is not unusual. I'm a great teacher. I know great teachers and you're not one of them. Bless. Okay, so this went on. And I was silent for a moment going, oh, this is a bit unusual. And then, of course, unfortunately, the Brabazon laugh came out and I guffawed. I thought it was funny as. And I obviously confirmed, look, you haven't received this result by your own benchmarking. <laughs> I'm 15% over the highest score that anyone else in the faculty has achieved. And obviously nobody, including you, in the university has received this result because it's the highest in the history of the institution. So of course I pointed to the institutional benchmarking and so forth and she just lost it. She started to shout, love a good shouter, yeah love a good shouter, and she also did that pointing, you know the, you know the woodpecker point, like you know they actually like poke your eye out, but anyway so she started to shout and point and stuff and she finished her diatribe with the phrase, quote, you are nothing, always remember that. You are nothing, always remember that. Now I'm putting that on a t-shirt, tremendous. But what I want you to remember from this story is the HR representative was sitting next to her through the entire process, did not take notes, did not look up, did not intervene. Now you may think this is bad. I'm the warm up act for what's about to happen to Steve. 
Now, Steve's father, Jeff Redhead, had died the previous week, summoning Jeff on this cold morning. Miss you, Jeff. So Jeff had died the previous week, and Steve continued to teach. He was amazing, continued to do his lectures and supervise his students, but obviously he was sad, and sad's the right word. Not despairing, but just desperately sad. And he kept everything very private to himself. He was a very private guy. Those of you that know him, he was a private guy. But he was very aware that anything, any emotion that he emitted, this dean would use. So he shut down. And this dean, after she'd finished with me, um, then turned to Steve and said, I note your father has died. I wanted to see you in person and state, I will not be approving your leave to attend the funeral. We've all got personal problems, and I note you haven't asked me about my father. End of quote. Now again, all the techniques of gaslighting are right there. Refusing the right of Steve to go to his own father's funeral. And what's interesting is he hadn't applied, hadn't applied to go to that funeral, to apply for leave. He hadn't asked. But you notice how a loss of that scale was minimised with the phrase, we've all got personal problems. And then returning the spotlight back to her with anger. You haven't even asked me about my father. Now, can I say, this is the first time we'd heard about her father since we arrived at the institution. Never been mentioned, never been talked about. He was in good health. I think the guy's still alive. Right. Okay, so this is one example from 30 minutes of the history of international higher education. So, yes, you'll notice she was a dreadful human, dreadful academic, dreadful leader, dreadful. But I want you to remember the institutional support for this dreadful behaviour by the HR person. They were present and they didn't intervene in the abuse. So these examples are common. I'm sure you have tons of examples where this exactly has happened to you. And these stories matter and we should tell them because it generalises the pain and we understand that we're not alone. But what I want to talk about today is gaslighting and why it is used in our organisations. So this dean was hired in a new university in a regional university, and that's gonna be important in a second. She had no leadership qualifications at all, and she'd had a really mediocre teaching and research career, and mediocre is being generous. So from this academic background, what was she going to do with the full professors in her own faculty? who were so much better than her in any metric you could consider in a metric-driven university. How would she manage her fear, her fear of being found out for being mediocre or substandard? How would she manage her fear of being found out when international scrutiny came upon her? So this meant she had to use every technique she could to push us all down, to unsettle us, and to discredit the academics who were better than she was. And better than her in the core business of a university too. Research, teaching, community engagement and service. So toxicity uses many strategies, whether it be fear, whether it be bullying, whether it be gaslighting, and of course the workplace place tactics we're seeing a lot at the moment. So redundancy, casualised workforces, endless restructures. The goal is to ensure that staff are frightened and they're complicit. And they're also complicit in the marginalisation of others. So people stand by and watch other people confront gaslighting. So gaslighting is a powerful technique in a toxic environment. It is a proxy for mediocre and substandard managers who attempt to discredit the staff that are better than they are. But somehow through patronage or leverage or whatever, these people have managed to get themselves into a position of power. But once the incompetent are in positions of power, what do they do? Well, they hire other incompetent people so that, again, they're not found out. And then they've got this powerful group that can activate gaslighting techniques. And, of course, particularly as academics, we're assessed 
continually. Our academic achievements have never been more visible than they are right now through digitisation. And we have a proliferation of metrics. So how many books have you written? How many articles have you written? How many articles have you written where you're the sole author, the first author, the last author? Teaching reviews, accreditation panels, keynotes, funding. Then, of course, there are the social media metrics. How many followers do you have? And most importantly, how do they engage with you? Do they respond with abuse and ridicule? Or do they respond with decency and respect towards you? Most importantly, whenever you offer a post or anything, is there just silence? That's always my favourite one. So in the old days, the analogue days, 20 years ago, incompetent managers, incompetent leaders could hide. They could actually hide away. Uh, they could cruise a bit because their behaviour wouldn't be that visible, at least for a while. But now, with Google Scholar and LinkedIn and Twitter, we can see exactly who this person is. We can see their research or lack thereof, and we can see their teaching excellence or lack thereof. So in two minutes, we can determine how few publications they have, how few citations they have, and we can see if they've been the freeloading postdoc through their entire career. So they're author three of six, author five of 10. And we can see for all their bluster about teaching and learning, they hold no teaching qualifications. And magically, there's no curriculum from their entire career that we can assess or evaluate. So the emperor, the provost, the dean, the deputy vice-chancellor, the vice-chancellor have no clothes. They're hypocrites. Therefore, if you're coming from this place of mediocrity, how do you get academics, bright people, to follow your leadership when you've underperformed through your entire career? And the answer is, you've guessed it, gaslighting, bullying, and the creation of a toxic workforce. Now, this has been studied, right? And let me show you how and why these techniques are intensifying now, and particularly in the weaker universities and the regional universities. So gaslighting is an intent, a desire, and an action. And the goal, the goal, is to threaten and intimidate and terrify. It's a repeated action, it's systematic, it's drip, 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 drip. And the other key characteristic of gaslighting is it requires a power imbalance. So gaslighting has nothing to do with the person who is experiencing gaslighting. That's important. You've done nothing. The whole situation is caused by an individual or a group of people who believe they're not getting the rewards, they're not getting the attention that they think they so desire. So when actioned by a leader in an organisation, such as a school or a university, gaslighting becomes the normative discourse, the frame through which interactions take place. So insider and outsider groups are created and the outcomes of these tactics destroy people's lives. So for the person, hi, for the person who is experiencing gaslighting, some dreadful outcomes occur, including suicide, but loneliness, depression, anxiety, despair, illness, continually feeling fear, feeling unsafe, confused, doubting ourselves. So gaslighting in the workplace is often invisible, as HR departments can't or won't deal with it, or in my case, as you saw, HR departments were actually part of the gaslighting. It is enacted by people in power, and we live in an age where power in our workplaces is aggressive, nasty, and brutalising. So, the only recourse to those experiencing gaslighting is to leave the organisation. So we'll come up with a series of strategies for you next week. If you're in the middle of it, how you can handle it. But all the research shows the only real way to deal with it is to leave the organisation. And the problem is, of course, because people endlessly leave the organisation, 
the problem becomes invisible. The only way in an organisation like a university to see if gaslighting is taking place is to look at the staff turnover. It's an inelegant proxy, but it is a proxy. So staff member after staff member after staff member have their lives ruined and they leave. So let's look at why gaslighting exists in universities right now and why it is being used as a managerial technique. And of course I go right back to our post one and remind you about the legendary Stanley Arnowitz and his The Knowledge Factory once more. Remember, Arnowitz confirmed that there are three pathways in our universities, research, teaching and administration. Arnowitz argued that the staff members that failed in research and teaching entered the third pathway, administration. So that is, they became managers. Now, it's a funny and it's a fabulous argument and it has a lot of truth to it. So this means that the poor teachers, the mediocre researchers, move to become an academic manager and then they rule over people who have succeeded in the areas in which they have failed. Now, Arnowitz made that argument in the year 2000. Think about everything that's happened in the last 22 years. We have the increased visibility of metrics, research outputs, teaching and learning evaluations, and of course, the rise of social media. So the underperformers and the hypocrites become very, very visible very quickly. So a university hires a poor manager, a poor leader, through a system or a process that may not be terribly accountable. And so once in a position of power, if we have one of these mediocre underperformers as our line manager, our lives are absolute hell. So these gaslighting activities were and are not unusual. There are tens of thousands of academics, high degree students and students more generally that are suffering this. There are thousands of universities around the world that use this <laughs> as their management plan. So gaslighting is the poor manager's means of control and it's intensified in particular universities and organisations. So a study by Timothy Charles Skinner in 2015 showed that gaslighting and bullying in regional universities was even worse than in metropolitan universities. 36% of academics in regional universities reported gaslighting and bullying and in one regional university 42% of staff reported gaslighting and bullying. And when they were asked in this survey about how this behaviour manifested, the staff responded with public humiliation, exclusion, intimidation and discrimination. And it gets worse. You've heard me talk a lot about nepotism about mates getting other mates jobs, about the internal appointments without processes or pretending that there's a process. Jobs for the boys, jobs for the girls. Now, I've seen this a lot and I've seen it a lot in regional universities and around the world. But what this study from Skinner showed, and you need to hang on to yourself, is the people who achieved jobs in regional Australian universities fair and square, so through a competitive process. Not nepotism, not an internal process, not mates hiring mates. The people who actually got the job for real with accountability, they suffered bullying and gaslighting more than other staff. So in my experience of regional universities around the world, and obviously I've been a very senior staff member in regional universities, I research regional universities, this is absolutely accurate. Because the fields for managerial posts in regional universities are so small and pretty mediocre, pretty ordinary people endlessly get the Dean, the Provost, the DVC, the Vice-Chancellor posts. They're inexperienced and often their experience comes from other mediocre regional universities, right? And they also come from a very, very, very narrow disciplinary base. 
very narrow discipline, which can't be generalised to the rest of a comprehensive university. So they move into these regional posts, lacking international profile, lacking credibility, lacking qualifications, lacking the disciplinary spread. So the only way that they can enforce their authority is through aggression, intimidation and gaslighting. Universities are now institutions of the precariat. Fear, instability, endless restructures. But these emotional tendencies and tactics and strategies are activated by a failure of leadership. And this is the final theory I wanted to introduce to you in the post this week. And this is for you, Gail, to explain why gaslighting is occurring and particularly, Gail, why it is intensifying right now. Now, I'm using Jean Baudrillard's theory of the double refusal. This phrase refers to the refusal of leaders to lead and the refusal of workers or citizens or people to follow their leadership. The double refusal, refusal of the leader to lead, refusal of the followers to follow their leadership. Now, Baudrillard revealed this work in his astonishing posthumous work, particularly the book, The Agony of Power. What a title, The Agony of Power. He states, quote, intelligence cannot and never will be able to be in power end of quote. So leadership is so weak at the moment, it holds no credibility or authority or agency. So all sorts of bizarre techniques like gaslighting have to be used to maintain power because the leaders are just so poor. Academics are looking at their career with a combination of horror and amusement. We're laughing at the lack of achievement in their career and therefore enact the double refusal. The refusal to be led by people lacking academic credibility. So this is why the techniques we're seeing at the moment in our universities have nothing to do with kindness or compassion or authenticity or honesty. The leader cannot lead, is frightened of being found out <laughs> and therefore focuses all the attention on the supposed weakness of the academics to deflect attention from their own record, their own career. As Zizek confirmed, quote, power itself is an embarrassment and there's no one to assume it fully, end of quote. The double refusal, therefore, provides a powerful framework to understand the irrationality, the cruelty of gaslighting, the shameful behaviour of the gaslighter. It remains a technique of the impotent and the mediocre. But the staggering selfishness is also worth noting. The leadership in so many of our universities around the world showed themselves unable to manage through the pandemic and the chaos we have now is the result of that. Leaders didn't lead and followers recognising the incompetence of their leaders simply stopped listening. The result of this double refusal is chaos, restructures, but also even more worrying, a complete loss of faith or belief in what a university is and what a university can be. So there's our discussion of gaslighting. It's a technique used by the mediocre and the incompetent to mask their mediocrity and incompetence. It is a strategy for the powerful to hide, to deflect, to displace, to, to confuse, but also to shame. Next week, most importantly for all of you in the middle of the situation, we're going to provide strategies to help you get out of it to enable you to survive, but to also give you an accurate mirror so you can interpret your circumstances, your contexts, and recognise that all of this behaviour is geared to hurt you, to disrespect you, and disconnect you from the reality of your life. 
I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.